I guess the question that comes to mind is if we are already seeing a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel and uh, when and how in fact we can get out of the tunnel. I'm Malu Cristobal and I'm your MC for today's Economic Briefing and GMM. To start our program on the right note, I'd like everybody to join me in this short prayer. Our most merciful God, we come to you in our weakness. We come to you in our fear. We come to you with trust, for you alone are our hope. We place before you the disease present in our world. We turn to you in our time of need. Bring wisdom to doctors, give understanding to scientists, and all caregivers with compassion and generosity. Bring healing to those who are ill, protect those who are most at risk, give comfort to those who have lost a loved one, welcome those who have died in your eternal home. Stabilize our communities, unite us in our compassion, Remove all fear from our hearts. Fill us with confidence in your care. Amen. May I now ask all of you to please put your right hand over your heart and join in the singing of the Philippine National Anthem. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Get yourselves comfortably settled as we move on to the next part of our program. At this point, I'd like to call on the MEP president and chair of the Far Eastern University, Mr. Gigi Montinola, for his welcome remarks. Gigi. Our guest speakers, Dr. Johanna Chua, Dr. Shell Habito, and Dr. Philip Medalia. Our distinguished guests from government, the diplomatic circle, academe and media, our board of governors, fellow MAP members, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Through this MAP economic briefing, we will be able to listen to three perspectives on the assessment of the country's economic performance for 2020 and the outlook for 2021 and beyond. We are fortunate to have one member of the monetary board one local economist from the private sector, and one international and regional economist. MAP has always had economic briefings in the first quarter of each year to enable all MAP members to sharpen our forecasting tools for better business decision making. It provides a good opportunity for all of us to be enlightened on the country's economic outlook and learn how to meet the business opportunities and challenges we are bound to face. As I stressed in my inaugural address, our activities this year are guided by the theme, quote, the great reset leading for the common good, unquote. In pursuing MAP's mission of promoting management excellence for nation building, the MAP board 2021 focuses on the following top three priority programs. First, to safely reopen the economy. Second, to promote shared prosperity and ESG. 
environmental, social, and corporate governance. And third, to enhance member benefits via best practice uh, sharing. In my inaugural address last month, I mentioned a five-point platform that covers the following crises. A health crisis, an economic crisis, an environmental crisis, an, ed an education and learning crisis, and a social justice crisis. I am pleased to report that your MAP 2021 board is off to a good start in achieving our five point platform. For health, as promised, we are on track to ordering vaccines for our smaller members. Yesterday afternoon, we placed an order with ITC, ICTSI for around 140,000 doses of the Moderna vaccines for around 106 member organizations. These are scheduled for delivery in the third quarter this year. For economic, we hosted in last January's general management meeting, Secretary of Finance, Carlos Sani Dominguez as our inducting officer for the incoming board. Together with 50 other business organizations, we supported Secretary Dominguez's call and lobbied strongly for the passage of the CREATE Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentives for Enterprises Bill, which mainly reduces corporate income tax and provides a 250 million peso stimulus to the economy. Fortunately, our legislators responded to our joint call and their bicameral body approved the CREATE Bill in early February. And this is now at the desk of President Duterte. In addition, our MAP Transportation Committee has developed a comprehensive statement on, quote, mass transportation for mobility and climate change mitigation, unquote, to help fulfill economic and environmental objectives. Again, this follows what we stated in our January inaugural address and will soon be released. In the next few months, we will be updating you on the developments on the three remaining items in our five-point platform to address the five crises we brought up last month. Your MAP board met with 2021 MAP committee chairs and vice chairs this morning to listen to the 26 committees outline their major activities and priority implementation programs for 2021 to safely reopen the economy. Our next areas of focus then will be on environmental, education, and particularly social justice pressing issues of jobs, food, and values formation. We intend to operationalize the Philippine business community's covenant for shared prosperity inclusive of anti-hunger programs of both the government and the private sector. We will accordingly tailor fit future general management meetings to focus on this and other important topics. Please check your emails and Viber inboxes and our electronic newsletter, the MAP memo for regular updates on MAP programs and activities. Thank you for your continuing support. Thank you. Thank you, President Gigi, for your welcome remarks. We now move on to the presentation of our new members for their online induction. And to do the honors, I'd like to call on the chair of the MAP Membership Committee and the senior partner and ex-co member of Actual Acre Law, Attorney Francis Lim, who happens to be celebrating his birthday today. Uh, is uh, Attorney Francis joining us or is he on birthday leave? 
Malu, he's not on board, so please do the calling of okay. the Okay, uh, in that case, I will step into the very big shoes of Francis and uh, present the new members for induction. Can we have their names on screen, please? Okay, the first in our list is Ms. Rosanna Fajardo. She's partner and Philippine Consulting Head of SGV and Company. Our sponsors are Wilson Tan and Ramon Dizon. Uh, the next one is uh, Mr. John Eric Francia, President and CEO of AC Energy. And his sponsors are Dr. Donald Patrick Lim and Attorney Francis Lim. The next one is uh, Sir Ren Rene R.J. Aleta Ledesma Jr., Executive Chief Innovation Officer of Mercado Central Philippines, Inc. Sponsors are Donald Lim and Vince Lawrence Apejo. Next in the list is uh, Mr. Leonardo Leo Matignas Jr., Chief Risk Officer, ASEAN Risk Management Leader and Partner, SGV and Company. Sponsors are fellow SGVers, uh, Wilson Tan and Vicky Lee Salas. Next one is so Danilo Bongmohica II, CEO of Tailwind Digital Solutions, Inc. Sponsors are Ray Silvestre Canilao and Attorney Francis Lim. Do we have any more? Ms. Meredith Dith and Ngo, co-founder and CFO of MG Health Solutions, formerly MedGrocer. And sponsors are Jerome Uy and Francis Lim. Next one is attorney, I don't know if this is pronounced Ira or Ira, Paolo Pozon, senior partner, law offices of Pozon Ramos Recto, and former chief of staff, Anti-Red Tape Authority. And sponsors are Imelda Tiongson and Iselina Mantaring. Uh, the next one is Ms. Angeline C. Wen Tham, founder and CEO of ANCAS. Sponsors are Rizalina Mantaring and Francis Lim. Mr. Romeo Uyan Jr., EVP and COO of China Banking Corporation. Sponsors are Rizalina Mantaring and Francis Lim. Ms. Catherine Kathy Yang, Yap Yang, Head of Corporate Communications Group, PLDT Group. Sponsors are Francis Lim and Rosalina Mantarin. Okay, I, that's an impressive lineup. We're starting the year with on a very aggressive note. So can I call on our president to do the online induction? President Gigi. Yes. Uh, in, incoming members, uh, please stand uh, to give solemn, solemnity to the occasion at hand. Please hold your oath of membership with your left hand and raise your right hand uh, also. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, 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 I your name, <coughs> do hereby solemnly pledge, do hereby hereby solemnly solemnly pledge, pledge that I will perform well and faithfully I, I will perform well and faithfully, and faithfully to the best of my ability to the best, best of my, my ability, ability my ability my duties as a regular member my duties, my duties as, as a regular, regular member. member in order to contribute to the achievement of the objectives uh, in order to contribute to the, 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 the achievement, achievement of, of the objectives of the management association of the philippines so help me God. So help, help me God. God. Congratulations and welcome to the MAP. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Gigi. Thank and you. let's all welcome our new members with a warm virtual applause. They are yeah. certainly welcome addition to the fine roster of members of MAP. Now it is now time for our speakers to take center stage. But before I call on the first one, I need to do a bit of housekeeping. As participants to this GMM, your audio is automatically muted and your video have also been automatically turned off. Therefore, you will see the speakers but not your fellow participants. Now we encourage everybody to please raise your questions, but to do so 
you will have to type your questions and submit them by pressing on the Q&A button at the bottom end of your screen. Our MAP secretary will assist our moderator in, um, in asking your questions, or the questions in your behalf. If at any point during the DMM you lose connection, please just do the login as you did the first time around. Mm -hmm. I believe our speakers also have been briefed and requested to keep their presentations to 10 minutes to give time, ample time for the Q&A later on where the burning issues uh, will be brought to light. Now, in line with the MAP policy uh, and in the interest of time, we will not be making a lengthy introduction of our speakers. We'll be dispensing with it. But if you wish to have copies of the CV, CVs of our speakers, I believe that can be arranged with the secretary. And they're really most impressive. It's not every day that we attend meetings where we have three doctors as speakers and one quack doctor as moderator, as he likes to call himself. But I do believe he qualifies as a, as a doctor himself. And so with that, I would now like to call on our first speaker, the managing director and head of Asia, economic and market analysis of Citigroup, Dr. Joanna Chua. Joanna, you have the floor. Hi, um, good, mor good, after good morning, everyone. Let me just uh, uh, show you a little bit of my presentation. So first of all, I am extremely honored uh, to be with these esteemed speakers, Dr. Shell Habito and Dr. Philip Medalia, who I'm sure can give you a much more detailed flavor of prescriptions of the situation in the Philippines. I see here my role really just to kind of give you a kind of an outside view of how we view the evolution of what happened in Philippines relative to the rest of the world and relative to the region, and also talk about some of the risks uh, that we need to watch out for going forward and how Philippines should respond to that risk. So it is no surprise, I'm sure everyone knows this already, that Philippines underperformed the region on the growth front after outperforming prior to COVID. So Philippines grew, it contracted negative nine and a half percent last year. Uh, we are expecting a rebound of 7% growth this year. But based on our forecast path of how long it's going to take for Philippines to go back uh, to pre-COVID levels of output, we're not even expecting that to happen until the second half, the latter part of 2022. That means you have more than two and a half years of uh, permanent income and losses of output. And again, it's, not, it's one thing to go back to pre-COVID levels of output. It's another thing whether Philippines can recover back to pre-COVID level of trend growth. And that is the slowest recovery across the region and you know, across the glo a, a lot of comparable peers. For example, globally, we're, not ex we're expecting global GDP to go back to pre-COVID levels of output uh, by already the second half of this year. So Philippines is already quite late. And so it's kind of surprising to see that be so, be so seriously adverse in Philippines, given that Philippines had done well relative to previous years. And also that Philippine balance sheet has actually been very strong. And if we kind of think about why this has happened, I think there's really one of the big kind of obvious glaring kind of anomaly in Philippines is really how Philippines manage to kind of balance the life versus livelihood and the kind of containment measures that it had put into place to address some of the infection risk of COVID. Now, if you look at COVID, if you look at Philippine performance in terms of COVID, whether it comes to infection or deaths per million, Philippines certainly outperform relative to the rest of the world, but it came at a huge, huge cost. So when you look at mobility trackers that we track very closely, this is the mobility trackers from, from Google, what you find is that it has significantly underperformed mobility relative to the rest of the region. And in fact, when you compare Philippines to other economies like Indonesia, even India, which also had very harsh restrictions last year, Philippines kept the restriction for a lot longer than many of its peers. And there's a very big debate about what is really the optimal policy choice. These are very, very difficult political decisions that have to be made about how you balance life versus livelihood. On the one hand, I think clearly when the initial shock of the pandemic happened, there was a valid reason why you'd want to impose a lockdown because you wanted to equip yourself with effective contact tracing and testing capacity, ability to manage the pandemic. But then the question is, if you hold on to these measures, you have to start balancing the cost and benefit. And some economies in Asia, for example, India, did very harsh lockdown, similar to Philippines, but actually un unwound the lockdown a lot quicker as it kind of tried to balance the life versus livelihood. And you have some economies 
like Indonesia, that also is managing the COVID surge, but never really did a harsh lockdown and imposed a much more targeted lockdown approach. That was also a similar approach to Pakistan. And I'm sure in hindsight, when we look back, hindsight 2020, what had happened, we kind of make an argument to say that perhaps I think Philippines had kept these policy measures too contained for too long. And one of the challenges we really have about this, this virus is really the fact that this is going to last, you know, obviously the shock is lasting a lot longer than what people are expecting. And there's still a lot of lingering challenges that we have to, to manage. And I think the blanket approach to some of the restrictions should have probably been replaced by some more targeted approach as you start having to manage these risks. Now, obviously, as we, one of the big, big issues that's really been driving optimism and growth expectation is the story about the vaccine. And the hope is that vaccination will be able to suppress the infection such that reproduction rate will come down significantly low enough so that mobility can start becoming, people become less afraid and involuntary restrictions can be relaxed and that could really restore uh, GDP activity. And we do see there is a strong correlation between social distancing metrics and GDP growth Although that correlation has weakened over time as more and more people are adapting to the kind of weaker mobility. So when you look at the world, you see, okay, actually vaccination and actually rolling out vaccination would have had a very, very high growth beta to Philippines given the relatively impaired mobility. And yet, even though the benefits are very clear, we're quite late. So if you look across the world, and again, this is not unique to Philippines, but even within the emerging market context, Philippines is quite late. Now, the, the, start, the, the news that Gigi was mentioning, uh, Montenolo was mentioning in the beginning about kind of securing vaccines, that's obviously a welcome news. But this is going to be a, quite a challenge because, as you know, a lot of the Western vaccines, the ones that have come out off the gate and being approved by drug regulators, are pretty much been dominated by developed market supply. And if you look across the world and we kind of follow the supply sc schedule globally, the Philippines is actually quite the, the, even though the benefits would have been a lot a larger, actually the supply acquisition has been quite slower. And again, because we're seeing more and more of the, develop, the Western vaccines being hoarded by the developed markets, a lot of emerging economies, including Philippines, is gonna have to rely more on the Chinese vaccine, which again, I think will also be helpful. And there's been some new uh, positive news coming out of Russian vaccines with peer reviewed journals saying that it's actually effective. But again, production and a lot of things can go, go wrong. So it's very critical given the, the nature and the size of the economic shock the Philippines kind of really get through the supply and not only get the supply, but ensure it has the logistical framework to distribute the vaccines very effectively. Now, one of the challenges we have to note about this vaccine, and again, this is the long COVID shock. Uh, there's been recent results coming out of AstraZeneca. It seems to be that there are signs that, you know, uh, over time, some of the first generation vaccines may become increasingly less effective uh, in new mutations. For example, the B1135 variant from South Africa, it seems to show that some of the results of AstraZeneca, which unfortunately was the one that had a lot of production supply contracts that Oxford AstraZeneca uh, may actually show diminished efficacy on the South African variant, some cases actually quite low efficacy. So that really raises a lot of concern that if you have this important major vaccine provider, again, that, that, that faces a challenge. It also raises other questions whether some of the other vaccines over time, as this virus mutates, uh, you know, will become less effective. And so what's going to happen is over time, as the West continues to vaccinate, there's going to be a lot of talk about multiple jabs, uh, multiple jab vaccination. And again, that's going to mean that there's going to be some concern as the West continues to struggle with the, vi the virus and the vaccine. Again, the supply schedule might take a little bit longer. The other thing I wanted to say about the supply, I mean, of course, Philippines has some disadvantage because we're not like India. We're not a supply kind of a, a production hub for vaccines. But you did see some of the other emerging economies like Indonesia, like a number in the Middle East that signed up to phase three trials very early on. And then because of that, they're actually getting some of the earlier uh, phase three trial vaccination. Now, Philippines is having some news recently about phase three trials, latter stage trial under the solidarity, under the WHO, but we're a little bit later. And I guess the question is, could we have signed up earlier? Could that have also allowed us to get access to vaccine? Any advantage in kind of getting supply is critical because I think this has really been an important factor in why we have underperformed. Um, the other thing I want to say before I get into fiscal space is we also need to debate about what is, you know, I think what is the model of what we want to accomplish. I think when, when you look at countries like China, when you look at Vietnam, you look at places like Hong Kong or even Australia and New Zealand, their objective is really to eradicate the virus. 
uh, to really bring it down to zero. So they go hard on lockdown, they go hard and they go early. And then in the end, with the hope that the payoff will be felt once you get the virus transmission to zero. But I think we have to be realistic that in some emerging economies with high levels of urban population density and a lot of you know, kind of urban population, you know, that's very, very impractical to social distancing, you may never get really to zero. And so some amount of management of the virus really is kind of what we need to do. And we need to look at whether the lockdown measures and the, you know, are kind of complementary to that, uh, that achievement of that we'll never get to zero. So if we're never going to get to zero, we should try to form a more smart lockdown kind of policy measures. The other question where we, again, this is a big debate now is really, as you know, there's been a lot of policy response on the back of the COVID pandemic. And the question is, what would have been the optimal response for Philippines? Now, the good thing is Philippines went into this COVID crisis with very strong balance sheet, whether it's fiscal balance sheet, whether it's corporate balance sheet, whether it's external balance sheet. So you, could, you would have argued that certainly Philippines had fiscal space. Of course, there's a big distinction whether you're a developed economy where you have much more greater flexibility to really expand your fiscal space through a lot of bond issuance and your government debt is considered a safe asset and central bank asset purchases continue to, again, there's more and more leeway for central bank asset purchases without having to worry about inflationary pressures or kind of financial stability risk. Now, the question that we raise in Philippines is could Philippines have done more? And certainly uh, when you look at the metrics on debt metrics, when you look at comparable kind of, kind of fiscal measures, there, there's, one, there's an argument that Philippines could have done more. But I think beyond talking about the quantum, there's also the debate about what type of fiscal stimulus uh, could, could Philippines have done? I mean, if you look at some of the fiscal spending last year, there, there was a delay. Uh, now, some of that, there, there was obviously some um, the deferred fiscal spending that's going to get pushed back to 2021, but does raise concerns about what are the means, or what, how should fiscal policy have responded? Clearly, uh, Philippines has done some of this, obviously, providing fiscal response to the most vulnerable, to the most needy, really, uh, because this is a public health shock, really, to improve the capacity, the health capacity to deal with the virus is very, very critical to mitigate some of the downside risk. But then the other debate is really to what extent uh, can we also find ways for growth enhancing investment? Because again, what we also need to safeguard in Philippines is not just allowing Philippines to go back to pre-COVID levels of output, but really to be able to generate, uh, you wanna be able to also grow, you, you don't wanna just address the inequality and the, the shock of the pandemic, but you also want to be able to grow the pie so that in the future you can able to kind of mitigate some of the risk by being able to grow some of that new growth drivers from this pressure. And I think there is room for Philippines to have done this. Now, clearly, there's still a lot more talk about fiscal stimulus because this shock is dragging out. Now, remember, I think these mutations, these uh, the diminishing efficacy of the first generation vaccines, these are things that we're still going to have to deal with, which means that a lot of the social support, safety nets, we have to continue both cash support for, for the poor, et cetera, especially those that have been impacted very significantly. But I think it's also thinking, uh, it's also important to think about, well, how are we gonna recover from this pandemic? I think the other unfortunate casualty, which kind of makes Philippines a little bit different from the other region is really that Philippines went into the, prior to COVID, had an investment boom prior to COVID. In fact, it was a private investment led COVID boom. And then the question is, as we hit, there's a very, very large demand shock from COVID, it's gonna probably take a while for private investment to recover as they have to work out some of that excess capacity uh, from that boom. So the question is, what can government do? And then clearly there are still some avenues for investment because again, you don't wanna miss out on future productivity growth that can be done by investment. So if private sector is a little bit more impaired about expanding investment, what can the public sector do? And clearly infrastructure is one where there's still a lot of gaps that can be done. I'm um, clearly not just a regular infrastructure, but even you know, as we're reading this accelerated digitization and automation, clearly this digital infrastructure is very important. But again, the other avenue we really need to talk about is really if we, you know, we have to find new ways to attract investment. And if it's not private investment, it's foreign direct investment. And there's been a lot of talk about this. You know, I mean, if you look at the across Asia, again, this is all a relative race. You know, we're, we're talking about the, um, the lowering corporate income tax, the CREATE bill in, in Philippines. But prior to that, if you look at what's happened over the last couple of years, in 2009, uh, in India put a very large corporate income tax cut. Uh, actually, Vietnam did a corporate income tax even earlier. Malaysia did a whole tax waiver and fiscal incentives for FDI. 
in the latter part of 2019, this is before COVID happened. And when COVID hit, Indonesia announced its corporate income tax cut uh, with a path from 25 towards 20 in April. So everyone is doing everything they can. Then Indonesia also passed its omnibus investment law to really improve some of the investment regulation, make it more attractive. Because everyone realized when you, you don't want to waste an opportunity. You should, crisis is an opportunity. So you don't want to waste a crisis to create some reforms. And the question is a number of our regional peers have all been doing whatever, lowering corporate income taxes, making things much more competitive. And in Philippines, you know, this, this tax reform too has been taking a lot longer. It's been renamed twice and it's taking longer to pass. It's taking beyond, beyond the create, we still have things like the public service law, the retail liberalization act, a lot of the spending reform, we're still waiting. And meanwhile, the rest of the world is moving and the world is already becoming more challenging. So there's definitely a need for that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the other challenges we have to meet. Now, aside from fiscal policy, clearly fiscal has a lot of role to play to address some of the, the major demand shock and inequalities and the, the need for investment and growth enhancing investment. But clearly monetary policy also responded very aggressively to what's happened in this pandemic. Now, one of the things that we need to watch is, I, I think especially in the developed market where they're already at the zero interest rate down and therefore they had to do other avenues of asset purchases to loosen financial conditions where you're already in the zero interest rate bound. And so one of the questions people ask is, you know, over time, unfortunately, the transmission channel of a lot of monetary easing in the developed market is being worked through asset prices in the hope that that will eventually lead to a drive in the real economy. And there's more and more talk now about, you know, concerns about the trade-off, the policy trade-off, uh, when the transmission becomes inefficient and it's leading more to asset prices than support to the real economy. And that trade-off, when it becomes very adverse, there's a risk that some of that stimulus will be tapered or reduced. And again, that's something that the market's very, very cognizant about. I think this year, and this is just more of an external factor, China, which again, last year was very effective in managing the virus, but it's also been able to support the economy by a huge expansion of credit easing at a time when the leverage was already very high going into this COVID crisis. So China did not cut rates effective, uh, aggressively. They kept the cost of capital high, but they expanded the quantity. Now, the, one of the things we need to watch in the market, especially starting this year, is if we've got this kind of recovery and very uneven recovery, China might start withdrawing some of that stimulus. And even in the US, now that there's talk that we are actually expecting US will grow 5.4% this year with an additional fiscal stimulus uh, of one and a half trillion. And Yellen, Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary Yellen says, we're gonna do this full stimulus. We may actually get to full employment by the end of 2022 in the US. There's also the risk of the Fed. Should the Fed still keep policy as accommodative as it has been? And if it doesn't and then starts withdrawing that, that is something we need to watch as a source of volatility. So I think in the Philippines case, the so Philippines or BSP has already done a lot of monetary easing, but I'm just cognizant that we, we right now, a lot of the asset prices continue to be the beneficiary of a lot of the monetary easing and the risk reward and the inequities driven by that uh, will could create some risks going forward. And the question is, it's the role of fiscal policy. What is the role of fiscal policy in creating tax and transfer systems that can amend some of the inadequacies and the inefficiencies and inequalities brought about by monetary policy. Uh, now, um, I, I do think that we have to be, Alain, right now there's a lot of concern that with this rise of activity and this rise of asset prices and oil prices having rebound, we may have a lot of potential supply side inflationary risks and that could raise some risk uh, in terms of monetary policy have to tighten further. But I do think that the history of pandemics and there's a, a widely cited paper uh, on the left-hand chart, looking at the long history of pandemics since the Black Death that show that actually pandemics uh, historically had had a very depressing impact on real rates, which is very different from war. And so I still think that despite some of the short-term supply side base effect on inflation, we do have to worry about long-term scarring from these pandemics. And scarring comes from prolonged precautionary behavior, especially if people do not have adequate social safety nets, uh, you know, in Philippines, when you have very high levels of informal sector employment and don't get a, as much cash transfer benefits, this prolonged scarring on behavior is going to be an issue. This labor market dislocation that's going to impact productivity growth, especially access to schooling and education, that's going to have long-term implication on productivity growth. Historically, remittances have been like a social safety net 
uh, for acted as a social safety net. The question is, you know, it act actually has relatively underperformed some of its peers. Is that going to continually be, uh, is mobility of workers going to be impacted by the rising automation and greater migration frictions and travel frictions that may linger because of this pandemic? The other structural changes, again, you know, we have to rethink what is the growth model for Philippines going forward. We've always relied on services. And in the last couple of years, we were hoping for more kind of cross-border tourism, the Pogo, all these other activity. And the question is, that might take a long time to pan out. As you know, tourism is going to take a long time to recover. And China, with its threshold of targeting zero infection, very, very harsh infection, and with all these mutations and variants of the virus, it's depressing efficacy of vaccines. Uh, I think you would imagine that China is going to keep the border shut for a long period of time. And that... For China's perspective, that's not, a, that's not a huge net economic loss because China actually is, a, is an importer of tourism. So definitely they trap the domestic Chinese travelers in China can actually boost domestic services, but it's an impact. It has a negative impact on everyone else. And I do want to point out that if you compare Philippines to some of the other economies in Asia, and this is why, you know, even though India and Philippines both did very harsh lockdowns in 2020, the economic impact has actually been much more severe in Philippines than India. And part of the big positive growth in India was really rural consumption. And we didn't have a lot of this. If you look at the share of activity in, in India that was in the recreation, travel, tourism, and even sort of services that were very vulnerable, uh, they had a lot of people in the agricultural sector, which wasn't as badly hit, which was actually much more resilient. While Philippines is a lot more exposed to services. So you have an economic structure, very sensitive to social distancing and a very harsh regime for lockdown. Uh, and not trying to balance a life and uh, life and livelihood really create a huge economic cost. So for now, I think one of the questions that also people ask is, we do think, of course, now there's been a lot of concern with the stimulus out of the U.S. that's driving up nominal yields in the U.S. Uh, you know, the question is, is that going to drive, is, is that going to reverse some of the dollar weakness? And we've already seen a little bit of a dollar strength. But as long as the Fed, if the Fed remains accommodative, and it's almost like the Fed is trapped to remain accommodative. We're not even talking about fiscal dominance in central banking. We're talking about capital market dominance and the difficulty to unwind stimulus because of the impact on markets. If the Fed remains accommodative while inflation expectations go up because of stimulus and real yields are going to stay low to support dollar weakness, uh, this, it's going to raise questions about currency and what it means for the rest of the region. We are bullish on renminbi, for example. But last year, we had a lot of FX intervention last year. And the question is, you know, could we see more of that? And should we see more of that this year, especially if we have a very uneven even recovery and it's going to take a longer time for the Philippines to recover? And with that, I'm going to end here and pass it on to, uh, to the next speaker. Very much, Dr. Joanna, for the very interesting points that you raised, which I'm certain our moderator is keen to delve on deeper later on. But in the meantime, we will save the questions for later. And let me now call on our second speaker, our very own MAP member and chair of Brain Trust, Knowledge and Options for Sustainable Development, Dr. Shell Abito. Dr. Shell. Thank you and good morning. Uh, let me just put up my screen now. All right, well, my, my presentation today, I'll try to keep within the 10, at max 15 minutes draws from my columns from last week and today, uh, essentially talking about the two wheels that will carry our uh, economy forward. And of course, the human cost, uh, which I was actually asked to focus on today. Let me first ask, where are we now? Well, I don't need to dwell too much on this. We've heard so much about it from Joanna and from everybody else, in fact. But the, the, the most uh, sober, sobering fact is that we have done the worst, at least among our comparable neighbors. In what, my, what, in what I call my pitic test, pressure, trabajo, quita. So in terms of the pressure, our inflation rate is second only to Vietnam, but look, Vietnam had positive growth this year. Uh, unemployment rate and uh, GDP growth have been actually the worst in the 10 ASEAN countries. Now, really what I said earlier, the most telling is the human cost of the economic decline. And Johanna has already told us about how we may have over, uh, overdone it to, uh, a little bit you know, in trying to shut down our economy for the sake of stopping the virus. And of course, the human cost was worsened by the fact that we had the Taal volcano and other uh, natural calamities early in the year and then late in the year. 
So this has exacted great toll on human lives and properties and well beings. And so that already is another big handicap. But in particular, poverty and hunger have escalated in the past year. And we've been seeing all the numbers in the media. Hunger actually tripled at some point, yeah. but a uh, year long, it has actually doubled uh, as, as I'll show you in a while. And here it is. According to self-rated poverty measures at the social weather stations, which is the most uh, current that we can get because poverty officially is measured only every three years by the Philippine Statistics Authority. But here we see the people who consider some, themselves non-poor have dropped down to 16%. The rest are either borderline poor or poor by their own perceptions. But the more worrisome part is how hunger had actually jumped by July to 31%. And right now, full year, uh, SWS puts it at 21% against 9.3% uh, 90, uh, last year. Now, in short, hunger has doubled. Now, this has implications on the already high rates of severe malnutrition and stunting in young children, which we have I've long been talking about in my, my, my talks, has led to some kind of a lost generation for us because of the impairment on brain and physical development in uh, stunted young children. And mind you, that has taken one out of three of our young children. And this is the chart that shows you, and uh, 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 this actually could be traced back to the 80s when it was 45% of stunting. And so this is literally an epidemic and frankly actually leads, leads to more deaths annually than COVID has uh, actually uh, had mortalities for in the, in the past year alone. Education is the other important uh, concern that has taken a severe blow. As we all know, remote learning has had to be the norm and this leaves behind children who cannot even afford the device to get connected. And of course, uh, from far flung communities who have no or limited uh, internet connectivity. And you know, you see here a picture at the right of even teachers having to go up the roof to get a good signal and transmit their lessons to their students. And so both of these, and Johanna has already alluded to this, uh, are a very, uh, give a very long threat, a long-term threat to our country in the social, economic, ecological, political, and cultural realms. If I had more time, I could actually elaborate on now in each of these dimensions of human welfare. These, just the, the, the lack of uh, adequate education and poverty and hunger right now are really impacting on our long-term future. So where are we headed? Well, I like to point out we have a bumpy road ahead and I think we all know that. Let me just take a few road bumps. The first road bump is the fact that we're unable still to attract foreign direct investments as much as our neighbors can. In fact, our FDI inflows have fallen for three years in a row. But these actually rose in neighbors like Thailand and Vietnam who were able to cash in on the exodus out of China, especially in the wake of the US-China trade war. Now we also have the strong peso as a road bump. And you know, why, why, why is it a road bump? Well, that, the reason I actually hate using the word strong to describe an appreciating peso is that it makes people think it's a good thing, but it's actually a very painful thing for um, too many Filipinos. In fact, we, we keep saying, well, exporters are suffering, but mind you, it's also domestically oriented enterprises who are actually hurt because they have to compete with even cheaper imports now. So if you look at the chart, it looks like we were appreciating from the start of last year but frankly, if you look at the longer perspective from 2016, you know, we actually, the peso actually uh, depreciated. And then it was only in the past year that it has sort of uh, recovered, but we're not even uh, you know, at, at the level that uh, our neighboring currencies had achieved in terms of appreciation. But like I said, uh, this is not exactly a, a, a bad thing. So we now have a road bump, which is something that Joanna also pointed out, this uh, mobility index. Uh, and what this shows is that the Philippines, the Filipinos in particular, have had the worst confidence about going out and resuming their normal activities. So our, our uh, mobility index sank by as low as 42%. But if you look at the others, some have already gone beyond their original mobilities, uh, even before the pandemic hit. And then road bump number four, the fact that large and small businesses are actually folding up. The picture on the left was taken by an Ateneo colleague who saw a large pile of papers in the Paranaque City Hall of uh, businesses that are actually closing down. These are retired business licenses. 
And he's, he also mentioned that he, was, he attempted to close his own business and he actually ended up paying about 10,000 pesos in fees and taxes just to close the business formally. And I've heard anecdotes of small enterprises ending up paying even higher taxes in 2020 in spite of the pandemic. And of course, we see all this news now about big companies like Philippine Airlines cutting uh, a lot of jobs. And this picture of the KFC branch in UP Los Baños is pathetic because they boarded up and you know, they, they simply decided that it was not worth continuing to open. So what we're seeing is really a, a, a real challenge going ahead for the economy in particular. And of course, we've all heard about the kind of recovery we might get, L, U, V, W, uh, even the Nike swoosh shape. But frankly, what concerns many of us is the K-shaped recovery, which means it's really going to be a differential effect. In the economy itself, there are industries who will need continuing assistance because they were badly hit. The tourism industry is the obvious one, but there are industries that actually have been taking off. In fact, even during the pandemic, we're taking off like technology industries, e-commerce and all these digital economy, uh, various industries in the digital economy. And another way to look at the K-shaped recovery is simply the divergence between the haves and the have-nots, where uh, the poor continue to be uh, in their difficulties because still the lack of a job or livelihood, while the more uh, well-to-do and the more fortunate in our economy and society are already beginning to see their lives uh, resume gradually. So again, this is the kind of divergence that we would like to avoid because we've been talking about inclusive growth and inclusive development all this time. And we are seeing much more exclusion happening at the moment. Now, in terms of stimulating the economy to get back to recovery, how should we really be using that stimulus money? Well, I submit given our particular circumstances and Joan has also alluded to this, that we need to actually look at the demand side first because there's, you know, if people are not buying, enterprises won't even find it worthwhile to actually produce and sell. So stimulus money is better put in people's pockets rather than in the banks right now where they are, because as we know, people are not even lending. And of course, the enterprises would be reluctant to borrow if they don't see any customers coming back anyway. So we need the sustained cash transfers for the poor, the hungry and the displaced especially, especially after the typhoons uh, worsened the plight of those who are already affected by the COVID lockdowns. And of course, we have to spend money to get the three T's right, meaning testing, tracing, treatment. And of course, now vaccination, because the goal is really to restore confidence, get those Google mobility indexes up again so that people are moving around again. And so it's the confianza that uh, we have to uh, actually restore to go out and spend again. And meanwhile, whatever money we spend, have to have, we have to maximize the multiplier effect of that by domestic uh, spending and not spending uh, as much as possible on imports. I mean, one example, we got news of a presidential jet being acquired for billions of pesos. Uh, so obviously the multiplier effect of that payment is going to be in Texas or in the United States, not in the economy uh, where we want it to be. So the, I, I think the, the lesson right now is let's buy domestic as much as we can and buy local even. And by that, I mean your local community enterprises and producers. Uh, we should look to patronizing them as much as we can if we had the choice, because we're helping our local economies that way. Only then could supply side support really be effective. And that of course means assisting businesses, especially the small ones, many of whom uh, have been folding up. And you know, we, we are cons our concern here is for them to be able to retain the workers so that jobs can be sustained. And so, well, we, we should not be doing what we have traditionally been doing, which is throw more hurdles uh, on the way of small businesses. What we need to do is help subsidize the incremental cost that small businesses have incurred, including safety protocol measures and the, the foot mats and all the face masks and even the COVID tests of employees or something maybe worth subsidizing because we need that. Now, the other important thing is easing the red tape and documentary requirements that are burdening small businesses. What we need is tax relief, not no new tax burdens, including burdens uh, to close a business. As I mentioned, uh, a colleague had to spend 10,000 pesos just to close uh, his business. And so this is where I talk about the two wheels that I think uh, would really make our economy roll forward in our recovery. And one of this 
was quite obvious from the numbers we were getting uh, in the past year. Agriculture slash agribusiness. Agriculture production continued to have positive growth in the second and third quarters. And unfortunately was just affected by calamities and the African swine fever in the fourth quarter. That's why there was a downturn in the end. But agricultural production is prevalent across all regions of the country. So it's geographically inclusive. And this is really as opposed to industry, which if you look at the breakdown of gross regional domestic product, really industry plays a very uh, small role in many of our regions. At the same time, agricultural productivity has been on the rise after decades of actually dropping or stagnating. So I, I, I like to think that this is because we have opened up our agricultural sector to more open trade which has impelled, in fact, uh, investments in greater productivity, both on the part of government and on the part of the producers themselves. It's also strongly interlinked with the rest of the economy. That's why I think about agriculture and industry interface through agri-based industries. Think about the agriculture services interface through agritourism. And of course, how digital tools are now helping agriculture become more productive and in fact more efficient. So again, there's that strong linkage all across. At the same time, we like to also uh, welcome the fact that we have a technocrat at the helm of the Department of Agriculture. The past politicians put at the head of the Department of Agriculture were unable to actually uplift the agricultural sector. So I think there's much more promise now. Now the other wheel, and this I, I, I call the wheel for accelerated recovery is again, the obvious thing that thrived in fact through the pandemic, the digital economy and the allied industries. So it was the only other major sector to see growth through the pandemic. And this obviously is fostered by the new normal we're beginning to see. We all, I, don't, I don't need to tell ourselves now that uh, domestic and cross country retail sales are now uh, digital, mostly digital, digital meetings and events. Uh, we're in Zoom right now. Entertainment, Netflix have, uh, has been something everybody has been patronizing now. Payment systems, business to business transactions, manufacturing process, you name it. This is what we've been calling the industry 4.0 or the fourth industrial revolution. It was coming even before the pandemic. So this, the digital economy also helps foster accelerated agriculture and agribusiness growth. As I already mentioned, the application of digital tools to improve the, all, the value chain all the way from finance to field to fourth, meaning again, the production to consumption. Of course, it requires substantial public and private investments in upgrading and widening our connectivity. Otherwise, it's going to be an exclusive gap widener because the digital divide becomes uh, particularly distinct in the Philippines. So it also requires an upgraded logistic system with much wider reach. And by the way, I've been pointing out that perhaps there's a defemination, a defeminization of our retail because now the malls, which of course employed lots of women, uh, now the last mile from the sellers to the consumer is through these guys on motorcycles and vans delivering our Lazada or Shopee products that we bought online. So unfortunately, that's more of men in those kinds of jobs on that last mile this time. So again, this is the kind of change that's happening in our economy, but we have to really capitalize on it and uh, try to enhance it to make it much more inclusive for everybody. So again, this is the fourth industrial revolution. And as I said in my recent column, the pandemic simply sped up what was already happening through the industry point four, uh, industry 4.0 that uh, we have all been talking about and how we have to prepare for that. So I'd just like to point out before I end that there is in fact a longer term challenge. The economic crisis is there, but frankly, climate change is threatening everything that we're talking about. It is the biggest shark that uh, threatens to swallow us all. So we do have to remember that there is that concern that we also have to address. So in closing, let me just say, well, we could not, we should not be waiting for things to get better. As uh, at least uh, Secretary Carl Chua of Neda has been saying, we must learn to dance with the virus because even according to the scriptures, farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. And if they watch every cloud, they will never harvest. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer questions later. Thank you very much, Dr. Shell, and uh, you presented uh, some alarming data. I guess that bear further discussions later on in the Q&A. 
So for our final speaker, I'd like to call on the Monetary Board uh, member of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, Dr. Philip Medalia. Dr. Medalia. Hello, uh, good morning. Uh, uh, well, first of all, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, my plan was to cut down everything that has been said by, by Joanne and Shen. So I think I, I will need uh, much shorter time than, than both of them because they said uh, most of the things that uh, I wanted to say. Uh, there, uh, but what I'd like to emphasize is the most important thing that we can do is to make sure that the efforts to control the spread of the virus be a calculated one. If an effort to, uh, to cut debts by say five, 10, or even 100 will cost us say uh, two, three, four billion pesos, maybe uh, it's not worth it. You know? So of course the question is whether such a trade-off actually is, is possible. So, uh, so I support completely the, the uh, uh, the goal of making sure we do everything such that government efforts to spread the control of the virus destroys as little as possible of uh, our production. So unfortunately, that was not the case uh, at the very least the last uh, six or nine months, right? So. And uh, the way I'll, I'll show this is that it's also part of a way of educating people how to use national accounts. In other countries, they do quarter on quarter comparisons. And to be able to do that, you must adjust for seasonality. For instance, uh, if uh, every quarter, uh, if a normal quarter is one, uh, December is 1.05. And say uh, the, the, the last quarter is 1.05, and the first quarter is 0.95. So you can actually adjust uh, GDP uh, for seasonality. And what's clear there is the, the most expensive two weeks, perhaps in Philippine history, is the last uh, two weeks of March. Because if you look at the week, uh, quarter and quarter, the economy declined by more than 5%. And all of that accounted for by two weeks. Now, the, se the, the next most destructive period is uh, the second quarter because in just, uh, in just 12 weeks, we lost GDP, quarterly GDP declined again by another, uh, what, another 15%. Uh, so, uh, now, from that point on, there is some recovery because the, the third quarter is actually a plus eight and the fourth quarter is actually a plus, uh, plus uh, 5.3. So, of course, 13% uh, of something small is much smaller than 20% of something large. And that's the reason the economy is uh, actually almost 10% smaller now than, than last year. Now, uh, again, uh, the problem with using year on year is we will actually have a spike in growth in the second quarter because the base is so low. So that's why, uh, because of that, we'll, we'll have no problems uh, doing six, seven, or even 8% uh, uh, year on year growth, uh, average year on year growth. In other words, uh, 2021 uh, will be. Uh, 7% or even more than uh, the 2020 GDP. But that's nothing to throw about because uh, again, 7% uh, of uh, 0.9 is much smaller than 10% uh, of 100, okay? So, uh, and then it's only in 20, late 2022 where we will have some catching up, assuming some normalization of growth in in uh, 2022, where I am reluctant. By the way, my views are mine and not necessarily of my friend, then governor, Ben Jokno, and the other members of the monetary board and uh, of the BSP. 
uh, and I am very reluctant to make forecasts beyond uh, uh, 20, 2021 for two reasons. One is we really don't know what will happen to the virus. There's, there could be a variant, there could be uh, people not wanting to get the vaccine, et cetera, et cetera, all sorts of problems. So, uh, but still, the, we should we should have some growth in uh, in uh, 2022, but I'm not sure that it will be returning to our normal five to seven. Remember, by 2022, the base effects have disappeared. So, uh, therefore, you then this time uh, uh, you 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 will need a very high quarter. Uh, you'll have a 1.5 percent quarter on quarter growth four quarters in a row to, to do to do six to, to do six percent in 2022 and with uh, uncertainty about the elections uh, we don't even know who will be president uh, maybe Manny Pacquiao uh, and then of course the virus uh, we it's very hard to, to to say what will happen in 2022 but what uh, I assure you is that uh, we have a lot of space in the BSP for fairly accommodative uh, monetary uh, policy. Right now, I think the only debate is whether we cut or we don't cut, but uh, raising is not in the picture at all. Uh, I will not tell you where school I, what school I belong to, uh, but uh, the, the, uh, one can justify a, 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 a one or two more cuts, but one can also easily justify, uh, depending on one's arguments, uh, not, uh, be happy with the current, because the current actually, even if inflation returns to normal, okay, uh, which we are quite sure will happen, uh, normal is maybe 3%, uh, is already, a we're already in real terms in negative uh, interest rate uh, territory. Also, when you look at the way we conduct our interest rate corridor, where we pay uh, overnight deposits much less than reverse repo. So the weighted average cost of our borrowing is really 1.6%. So from the point of view of the banks, uh, the, uh, the, the alternative to not lending is earning only 1.6% from the BSP or earning 1.2% from the treasury. So uh, really the, the problem is, in other words, the, the, the reason they, they are not lending uh, is that number one, uh, they, they are in it for the long haul uh, because uh, the last thing you want is uh, a lot of bad loans when it turns out that the, the pandemic lasts uh, beyond uh, the effects of the, the negative effects of the pandemic are very strong and last way beyond 2022. If I were a bank, I'd be very conservative too. Now, uh, the, now, so from the point of view of BSP, the, 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 uh, my view is we have to, of course, look at uh, financial stability. And uh, of course, the way our economy is structured, uh, uh, for instance, if you look at the flow of funds, of uh, Philippines, uh, two sectors account for 70% of the, uh, oh, three fourths of the CAPEX. One is a good, both good things, which partly explains our productivity growth. Uh, uh, accounting for more than 70% of the CAPEX are the non-financial corporations and the, and the government. Now, the problem of course is with this uh, fact that demand is now less than capacity there will be lower uh, private investments. So the question is, uh, what does the monetary board do? One is, it should be very supportive of the fiscal sector, because the last thing we want is a very gun shy, uh, a very gun shy fiscal authority, because you have tight, uh, they think monetary policy will be tightened. And then they will end up when their, their loans mature, they, they uh, will have had, uh, very costly re refinancing them. So, so, so in other words, uh, so we, we, we probably can say that we, we will remain in this low, in, 
negative real interest rate uh, policy for at least uh, a year or two. And even if it, in real terms, even if it rises, it will be below, below one, uh, 23 and, and beyond. Okay, so now the other things we can, of course, use regulatory relief, uh, make, the, make sure the banks uh, are, are not to uh, stingy in, in lending. And therefore we can say, well, uh, maybe we can relax uh, some of the capital uh, capitalization regula regulations and so on and so forth. But as, keep, as they keep saying, uh, there's only so much that monetary authorities can do that, you know, you, the monetary authorities can bring the cow uh, near the water, but uh, you cannot force it to drink the water. So, uh, so clearly, uh, uh, fiscal uh, policy is extremely important, and our role is to effectively signal to the government, "Hey, uh, we're here to support you. Uh, if you have good projects, do it. No matter what happens to the deficit." Now, why do I say good projects? Because the problem is that uh, in future, if debt GDP becomes high and creditors find it risky to lend to the Philippines, effectively the money you spend today is money you cannot spend tomorrow. Uh, so you will... will uh, I, the, the reason I take this way is when I was in it, that the, the spread was uh, uh, ROP versus the equivalent 10-year uh, uh, US dollar treasury loan, uh, the spread was 100, 700 basis points. Now it's below 100. We, we, the last thing we want is go to that, go back to that uh, era. So, uh, so, so therefore, it, it, my point is, if you have a good project, do it or even advance it. The problem with that is that that's easier said than done. Uh, because uh, I, I sit for the monetary board in the investment coordinating committee. And of course, when I was in NEDA, I was co-chair of the investment coordinating committee. Very often, uh, many of the projects are really just project titles and descriptions, not really shovel ready. Uh, uh, Okay, let me give you an example. The, the first estimate of the, the uh, Mindanao Railroad portion, the, the so-called so doable portion, was uh, al almost only half of the final estimate. And I asked why. Well, they did not include all the ravines, uh, difficult parts of the, 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 the topography that the train has to go through. And as you know, a train, it, it's very hard for a train to climb. And when you factor that in, voila, your cost have doubled. So, that, so that's the big problem. There are, so the, the best thing that this carrot administration group can do is invest in, uh, invest in the pipeline of project. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, the best thing that the next administration can do is uh, uh, take ownership. Okay? And, uh, and, and that was plagiarized. Okay? So, uh, so now, there are other solutions being offered, like uh, in Arise. And I'm, I'm quite doubtful of such things because they, they require uh, capacity that is not found in government. Like, okay, uh, pick the jobs that will be saved, uh, conduct capacity building, uh, uh, have a pro program for agriculture. We've had all that before. Uh, the ability to do it is just not there. So I, if I, uh, by the way, uh, and also it's election year, so it's a terrible time to be swinging around money that uh, has uh, non-transparent, non -transparent, not hard, hard to monitor uh, uh, projects. So I'll go for things that simply address hunger. Uh, and uh, maybe, of course, uh, uh, things that, make it easy to dance with the virus, okay? So subsidies of, uh, for instance, the, 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 the area where I'm uh, quite optimistic is uh, domestic tourism. I know that my, uh, I have a very large sample, my wife, you know? So she's uh, already thinking of traveling and she cannot, she's itching to travel abroad, but she knows, she knows she can't do it 
just thinking about what she has to do to travel abroad. She's not traveling abroad. So uh, she's already planning trips to Boracay, uh, Palawan. So it, what government can do is make testing very cheap. And, and as the saliva, saliva tests uh, become available, the, that, that's a nice place to go because uh, as we know uh, from the science of it, uh, when you have open air, and you're not in air-conditioned places, the, the virus, and you're not very close to anybody, the virus does not really uh, transmit very well. So, so, so my point is to be a bit optimistic that uh, with the, and then if we can vaccinate uh, the frontliners and the vulnerable people like me, my age, uh, then uh, the, the, the people who, who decide the quarantines uh, will, will, will be less draconian. And as, as, as I said earlier, the data shows that the problem with draconian uh, measures is they do reduce the transmission of the disease, but the cost is just uh, too high. Uh, and maybe not worth the, in other words, the, 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 goal, the goal is not to have zero, zero infections, but the goal is to have manageable infections. That is the, Infections. Uh, wait, wait. We we already know the death rates are not high, so that the, the infections do not uh, overwhelm the the, the the tertiary healthcare system. By the way, there's a very simple solution to that, which is subsidize private hospitals that convert uh, a lot of their capacity into into uh, COVID care. Right. So that's a lot cheaper than than losing 1.5 uh, uh, trillion in the economy. So I think, uh, uh, but we have to be very aware of, of maintaining our fiscal credibility and stability and, and, fis and uh, the maintaining the low spreads uh, that we have so difficult to, what's so difficult and took decades to achieve. And then, uh, and then finally, uh, it's, a, it, it's quite important to, to, uh, to focus on, on, uh, on, on, on making sure that, that uh, by the way, I, I noticed, for instance, I noticed, for instance, that economic managers are a lot less, lot less risk averse than the IATF, okay? And it turns out the politicians are even more risk averse than the IATF. So creating a situations where you can give uh, politicians Local, local and national and the members of the IATF more confidence to, to allow us to dance with the virus. Uh, so maybe what we need are the eyes, you know, dusting instructors. You know? so, uh, the, so, so the economy should be able to grow by 7% next year. But as I said, maybe we'll be, we, we, if you look at the experience recovering from past crises, you have a slow economic growth for two, two three, uh, well, of course, if you use the Asian crisis, five five years of balance sheet repair. But I don't think I don't think we are anywhere near the the Asian crisis in terms of balance sheet repair. Because to begin with, we do not have the problems with spiking interest rates and uh, uh, spiking exchange rate uh, and maturity and exchange rate mismatches. So I'm uh, I'm a lot more optimistic that we. We will get seven or maybe even more this year because of sheer uh, low base. And second, with uh, cheaper, uh, cheaper and faster uh, testing and greater capacity for isolation, uh, plus the fact that we should be able to vaccinate the, the frontliners and the, the most vulnerable, even 2022 will be a, a good year, not necessarily in terms of returning immediately to five to 7% growth, but uh, uh, the baseline scenario is by 2023, you should, we should be able to do it. Of course, a lot of things that can happen that, that uh, can uh, generate something else. And if that happens, we should be of course quite aware that the, the, the role of the BSP is always to look at the uh, financial uh, angle, financial stability angle, and like it or not, with the very underdeveloped capital markets, by the way, that's what we should develop, capital markets. Uh, the, the fate of banks are so dependent on one, what happens to non-financial corporations. 
So, so I think that's that. That's the other thing that we have to do: develop capital market so that the the you do not put your 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 banking system at risk uh, to finance uh, projects that have some risk that are that are very good for uh, for development. And I think one place to start there is the fees are just too high. Uh, it's it's so costly to to issue any, any bonds here in our country and. I don't know what other reforms have to happen. Uh, those of you who are members of the, the Capital Development uh, uh, Council, I, I think uh, this, this, are the time, this is the time to raise those, those, uh, uh, those suggestions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Medalia. You shared uh, some sobering thoughts that can be uh, discussed further. We now move on to the Q&A portion. To serve as our moderator, we have our MAP governor and assistant treasurer and the managing director of Lazaro Bernardo too, and associates, Mr. Romy Bernardo. Romy, uh, you have the floor. Yes. Uh, th thank you, Malu. Uh, now, first of all, thank you and congratulations to the speakers. Uh, we've had a pre-meeting and, and uh, we, we agreed on what they should cover, but they've done so much more. They've covered the subject extremely well, superbly, and you can see it from the... Uh, feedback in the chat group. Uh, let me try to uh, drill down to some of the issues that seem to be, be coming up. There seems to be some congruence on the analysis of where we are, i.e. Uh, a, a, perhaps our lockdown uh, took longer and harder than it should have, but we are, we are where we are. And uh, let me ask a forward-looking question. Uh, Secretary Shell and Secretary, former NEDA Secretary uh, Philip was, was there before. Um, and, and maybe Johanna is, is quite young. I'm sure at some, hopefully anyway, from where I sit, some future government will top her to be planning secretary. If you were advising the president at this time, uh, what two or three things would you recommend? Uh, please, uh, maybe I start with... Uh, who was secretary for Cecil Muna Siguro, and then, then Philip, and then Joanna. Thank right. you. Yeah, well, I would go back to my presentation and look at where the, the, the drivers or the wheels that, uh, are there, uh, uh, that we can capitalize on. And again, precisely agriculture and agribusiness, and mm -hmm. so many people agree to this, uh, have been neglected for far too long. And so we simply have to make sure that we are able to raise the productivity and I think that is happening now simply because we opened up um, agriculture. And the last, of course, was rice, which, uh, well, in spite of what other people are saying, uh, in fact, appears to be impelling precisely the kind of uh, the productivity increase that we expect from this kind of opening up. So the, the idea is further opening up. And I think even our Secretary of Finance has been very emphatic about this, in, in, especially in the investment area. So that's one important uh, road bump that we could actually uh, get rid of. Now, of course, if, if we talk about the digital economy, again, we have to simply gear up for the, the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution, which was going to happen with or without COVID anyway, and now more especially so. So it's in a way, it was a blessing in disguise yeah. that we had the COVID to, to accelerate our moves towards uh, getting up to speed in the digital economy. So that's another uh, a priority area to look at. But finally, <laughs> The most important is really to look at education and health because these are the long-term time bombs for us. So uh, I, I, many of you who have heard me in my different presentations know that I'm calling this demographic dividend, a demographic time bomb instead, simply because of this yeah. very severe stunting problem we have right now. One third of our labor force around 2050 will actually still be the products of that uh, stunted generation of five-year-olds right now one out of three. And so that means they would have had compromised brain and physical development, productivity will be much lower. And God forbid, uh, you know, that could lead to uh, more criminals and drug addicts and the kinds of uh, people that we don't really want to be uh, predominant in our uh, population. So those three. Uh, Philip? Well, uh, uh, Robbie. Uh, by the way, I forgot to say that much of what I had to say was in a sp speech I wrote for the FEF, and please share them with the uh, MLA. Well, 
Uh, if, if, if I did not have political constraints in mind, I will have a very long list. Uh, but uh, since I am a realist, I will focus on a few, but still quite difficult. Remove all those restrictions on imports that are not phytosanitary when it comes to food. Uh, of course, it's ideal that we raise our productivity in uh, producing food. Uh, but if you cannot do that, then you rely on outside sources. Okay, so protectionism, uh, get rid of it. And uh, of course, I know that MAP members are quite uh, hesitant to do this because of lack of trust. Re remove the restrictions on foreigners on very important uh, parts of the economy that determines uh, productivity. Right now, uh, fast internet, fast uh, telecoms is a very, very important part of the, having a digital economy. That uh, The problem with the digital economy is you have you will have side by side running a very old technology, which is as, as old as the older than the gospels. Okay, you remember when Christ was asked about who who is in the coin? It's uh, it's Caesar. In other words, you read it Senorage at that time. Two coins and and but at the same, at the same time, the the if 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 you have a two track system and and not enough people are using the digital, then it becomes very costly to maintain it. So in other words, you cannot have an equilibrium where uh, only say 10% of the people use it. Uh, enough people should use it and it has to be cheap. So we have to, Banco Central has to work together with the private sector on how to make this happen. And one way to do this is to keep fees low. Uh, exactly, because if you, if you want to get rid by the way, the biggest beneficiary would be the BSP itself. We spend billions of pesos on coinage and printing money. So maybe we should subsidize part of it to, to have a broader use of uh, uh, better than cash, the, 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 uh, better than cash uh, medium of payment. The other one is uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, well, of course, I'll go back to something very old, which is, uh, it's very hard to have a mal, uh, well nourished, well educated population when mothers who have not finished grade school are having five or six children. You know? I, 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 when I was a young assistant professor, I couldn't think. I, I, I was re, my, my, when, when my, my wife got pregnant, I did not know what to do uh, because, of course, that, that led me to doing consulting so I can feed my family. But uh, the if, you know, if, if a, a, UP, a UP professor with a PhD has to do consulting to, to, to feed three kids, well, which eventually became four, how, how can you imagine uh, the rural, rural poor women uh, managing seven, five, six, seven? Well, of course, some of them will become money pakyao, no? and they will be out of poverty, but that's uh, not very likely. So my advice is uh, not to listen to theories on, on family planning. The problem is we're listening to we're listening to celibate men who think that abstaining is easy. And therefore, uh, mura na, effective pa. You know? but, uh, but these are theorists, right? So uh, listen to the women and say, well, it's really a very hard thing to do. To, so uh, Use, use modern methods, and th th that should be heavily uh, encouraged by the state, provided that it's not uh, abortion. You know? so, Thank you. So the, yeah. Now, finally, finally, get agriculture accounts for what? More than twice yeah. in employment than in GDP. There are just uh, too many people in agriculture. And the uh, best way to do that is allow, 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 farm, uh, allow farm consolidation. And then, of course, create the manufacturing jobs that can absorb people from uh, agriculture. And that's why I, I think, I go back again to removing all those restrictions in the Constitution. This, together with CREATE, will send us a huge signal. Yeah. We'll, have a, we'll have a good start. Of course, uh, the problem there, as I said, is everybody say, well, who will be the next president? So at least the, the next president will have a good start, whoever he or she is. If we can, if we, if, if, if create is supported by a, 
a constitution that's much more friendly. I, I really cannot understand why foreign ownership should be uh, should have the same protections as the Bill of Rights. Okay, why they should be in the constitution? There should be restrictions on foreign ownership, but they do not deserve to be in the constitution. Okay, thank you, thank you, Philip. Oh, no, no, I, uh, I forgot one thing. I forgot one thing. I heard the exchange rate being mentioned. Yes. Uh, one, one simple fact is you cannot be an inflation targeting central bank and be uh, an exchange rate tar targeting central bank same because if an, an, ex an, an exchange rate targeting central bank will print as much money as necessary to prevent peso from uh, appreciating, which means you're no longer an, an inflation targeting central bank. That is a reform that took so long to achieve with such wonderful, important results. I think the, the exchange rate should be left to the fiscal authority. Okay, thank, thank yeah. you, Philip. I have, okay. I have a question on that, but I turned over to Johanna first. And... Yeah, yeah, very, very quickly. I, I think the only thing I wanted to add is we have to always remember what is the source of the shock? In the end, this was really a pandemic shock, which really hit demand, right? So really, even if the government started to unwind some of the lockdown, you know there's a lot of psychological scarring. So we really need to address and create and recover demand by ensuring that the government not only gets the vaccine, but has a plan to logistically roll out the vaccine and ensure that there's sufficient right. vaccination acceptance across the population. And you know, this is gonna be a long haul. I already mentioned to you earlier, we may need multiple jobs as this thing goes on. So we must have a strategic plan to get that in shape. And I totally agree with Philip. I mean, we can all boost rural productivity, but definitely we need, what, what is missing in the Philippines is we don't have broad-based jobs, especially in manufacturing. And, you know, everyone around the region has upped their game. Everyone is upping their game. And it's taking Philippines such a long time just to get some of these legislation through. So, I mean, first thing on the agenda, you have the CREATE bill, but then you have all these other things like you have to open up more public services, public utilities to foreign investment. If private investment is not going to be able to meet the demands, then you've got to open up for foreign investors and you need to stay competitive. And especially now as everyone's trying to maneuver itself to kind of get some of the supply chain, we've got RCEP now. So everyone's saying, oh, you know, we have Asia to Asia supply chain. Well, there's no reason why they would go to Philippines as everyone else provides a much better you know, inv investment environment. So that's, I think, the clear uh, gap in Philippines. Uh, what I've heard as well from everybody is there's probably more room for fiscal spending beyond what has already been budgeted. Am I understanding that correctly? And if, if, if that's the case, uh, where, where would you, if, if we had an extra 1% of GDP, that's about $150 billion, and, and you were planning yeah. secretary. Really? Where would you recommend they, they, they spend that? There's a Bayanihan 3 bill, by the way, being pushed by two um, economist colleagues, uh, uh, Joey Salceda and Stella Kimbo. Uh, do you support that uh, at this time? Uh, well, I, I, uh, thank you. Well, I'm, well I'm, 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 I'm a pessimist when it comes to government failures. Okay, so. Uh, so I, I would rather I would rather have an easy to monitor system like uh, feeding the poor and uh, feeding the children, uh, because as, as Shell pointed out, they they are our future, the, the children. The poor, on the other hand, that is our duty. So uh, so it, <clears throat> so if I had <clears throat> so to begin with, I would I would not have I would not have 400, 400 billion. Huh? And then I, 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 I and all, all those things that require skillful government, I'll scratch. Okay, so, uh, so, so that. Wala nang matitira, Philip. Hindi, meron, meron naman. May, may dalwa dun eh. May dalwa dun that I agree with. Yung, yung uh, ability of DOH to manage the disease. Nandun. At saka yun nga, yung education. Uh, improving, im, im, improving internet-based uh, education and so on and so forth. But the, the others, uh, like uh, deciding which jobs to save, deciding which firms to save. Oh, my God. Uh, we've seen this all before. And uh, by the way, the last time we did it, the last time we did it for, for uh, agriculture, we killed the rural banks. So, uh, so we, uh, let's, let's, be, let's, be, uh, let's be realistic about uh, what government can and cannot uh, do. Uh, I'm sorry, I moved because uh, my phone ran out of battery. Okay, so, uh, okay. Sorry, sorry, Robert, that was a bit long, but. Uh... Okay. Uh, yeah, Romy, you're muted. Uh, Shell, any comment on where government, yeah. if you had the control of 1% uh, of GDP, uh, where would you suggest that be spent for? 
Well, I, I put it down in my slide on how the, how, how, is, how much stimulus money be spent. Number one, put it in people's pockets. Again, you know, Johan was talking about the same, uh, spurring the demand side. And the reason there's no demand is people don't have the money. Uh, people have lost their job. So clearly, uh, we, we need to have more of that Ayuda type of uh, assistance to the most uh, in need of it. No? So uh, that's the that's, uh, first thing. And then again, managing the pandemic, again, going from what Johanna said, we have to invest a lot more in the three T's and uh, the vaccination and the rollout of the vaccine as well. And then uh, thirdly, uh, like Philip, I agree that we don't need to quibble about the magnitude of stimulus. We just make sure that the quality of the spending will really lead to that multiplier effect we want domestically. And, and by doing what I said, put it in people's pockets rather than putting it uh, and, and channeling it through the banks, hoping it will flow to the small enterprises who don't want to borrow anyway because of lack of demand. You know, we might as well do exactly what Philip uh, said earlier and address the, both the short-term and the long-term problems we're facing, as I have explained it. Joanna, any, any, no, any I defer addition? To I defer to Shell okay. and Philip. I pretty much agree <laughs> with everything they said, so we'll move on. <laughs> uh, okay, if I may, my last question before I read from the Q&A, which uh, will allow 30 minutes for that. Uh, the economic managers in public pronouncements have taken much comfort in the stability of the peso during this time. And indeed, it likely helped calm financial markets. I think uh, Joanna would agree with that and has ke helped kept keep inflation low. On the other hand, some economists, and we heard uh, Shell uh, being amongst them, have argued that the BSP and the DOF need to do more to arrest the peso's appreciation which has gone up by about 5% in trade-weighted terms, whereas most of our neighbors have actually depreciated, even though the dollar itself was weakening. Uh, in order to boost the earnings of OFW families, exporters, BPO workers, and thus boost GDP growth. Uh, they recommend, for example, for the BSP to buy more dollars or for the DOF to borrow less in dollars. Well, any further thoughts on, on what to government stance should be on, on this question. I think Philip, Philip was explaining to us the incompatibility of exchange rate and, and inflation targeting. Would you like to amplify on that, Philip? Uh, you're on mute, sir. Uh, you're on mute, Philip, sorry. If you're committed to letting money supply go sky high, to prevent uh, the peso, to, to make the peso weaker, nobody will believe your inflation targets. So, so in other words, uh, there, there's a limit to which exchange rate policy can be practiced by by uh, exchange rate money uh, by, uh, by by inflation targeting central bank. It's okay to say, well, I prevent it from crossing. Well, I will not use a real number, right? I will prevent it from crossing, uh, say, uh, 50. I, I use 50 because I don't want to sound like I have a target. <laughs> uh, uh, then uh, because we think it will reverse. And then later on, we can use this to prevent uh, excessive depreciation. And then the central bank makes money. But to, for, for the central bank to say, I don't care how much I lose, uh, I'll... I'll, I'll uh, I'll, I'll make the peso go anywhere I want. And then uh, if you don't care how much you lose, you will eventually monetize what you lost. And nobody will believe your inflation targets. So, so therefore, uh, the, the task then, and for instance, in Japan, the exchange rate is a finance, a ministry of finance issue, not, not a Bank of Japan issue. So also, if you are uh, seen as a, quote unquote currency manipulator, they, there are also negative consequences. So, so there is so one way one way to do it is, uh, of course, the way Singapore does it creates uh, sovereign wealth funds that uh, buys a lot of dollars to invest abroad. Okay, but remember the lessons from Malaysia: the cure can be worse than the disease. You know, the sovereign wealth fund was literally plundered. You know, so uh, so. But uh, so, but but as I said, the solution is largely uh, going to be uh, a go, 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 uh, government, the fiscal authority, which will bear the brunt of the of the exchange rate appreciation, is the best authority 
for managing uh, uh, the exchange rate. So, uh, okay. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, I, I think so. I wanted to say something on that and then. Sure, can I, 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 Romy, can I just add, um, you know, I, I agree with what uh, Medal is saying that Philip is saying that obviously there are some trade-offs between inflation targeting and effect policy targeting, but it's not a binary trade-off. It's a scale, right? We are in an environment where, of course, yeah. we do worry about supply side inflationary pressures. But when you look at what's happened with the size of the demand shock and the output gap that we have and the rising automation and digitization that's creating these you know, uneven productivity gains and deflationary, sector, uh, deflationary impact on wage pricing power, I kind of think that these trade-offs that we face, I don't think BSP is at the, the corner of the trade-off. I totally agree that fiscal policy does have a role. But there's a complementary role of central bank policy as well. So I, I do think, yes, you know, maybe at some point we will worry at some point that excessive liquidity creation can create you know, excessive credit demand and that could lead to inflationary pressures. But it doesn't seem obvious to me that we're in that cycle anytime now. Um, no, it's, it's uh, jo and Joanna. And IMF now, as IMF says, you know, there is no greater recognition of an integrated policy approach, right? Allowing oh, yeah. for capital flow management policies. Uh, as opposed to, you know, fully allowing a flexible exchange rate. So I think even the policy paradigm about right. how you're managing policy has changed. And even now, yeah. inflation targeting people are saying there's a flexible inflation targeting framework. By the way, jo Joanna, let me interrupt. Uh, we've been doing that for a long time. Yes. Uh, how did you know? Uh, of course, you must remember, a research used to be 40, and it yes. became it became uh, 90. Yes. yes. Okay. To be fair. It used, yeah. be, it used to be, uh, it yeah. used to be, it used to be 85. Now it's now it's uh, 120. By the way, the reason it's not going inflationary is the money is coming back to us and we're paying interest, yeah. right? Yeah. So, uh, so that's the that's the that's ah. the limitation. By the way, we also impose on uh, foreigners placing their money in our facilities. Yeah. So, so that but meaning the, the, the room yeah. for maneuver is not that large, yeah. believe me. Yeah. Uh, we, okay. we, 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 we caught okay. one back and told them to return all the interest they earned uh, in, uh, from, from placing their money in our SDA. So there are, there are, there are, there are things that we can do. And, uh, it, but it's really to say, well, I want the exchange rate to be 55. No. My God, that's, uh, that's, not, <laughs> that's, okay. not, that's, not, that's not possible, huh? And yeah. to be fair, I should have premised my question by saying that the central bank has been buying dollars. If I, you don't need to confirm this, uh, Philip, yeah. because I, I know you're so, there are certain uh, uh, things that you cannot talk freely about. Uh, but, uh, but I think the, the, the volume is still much less than, for example, during the time of Governor Tetanko. So there might be still some room. Uh, he, also on the other side. No, but by the way, Tetanko used up the room for joke, no? <laughs> okay. Uh, Shen, you want to? No, I'm just kidding. To, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, Governor Jokno, when he was Professor Jokno, was one of the most ardent advocates of a very activist competitive exchange rate. But we, we won't go into that. Uh, Shen, anything more to add before I, no, I go to I, the audience? I, Let, think I, 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 I think Philip and Joanna have said enough. I, I, I don't want to add further okay. to that. Uh, yeah. I, I, sh I should go to the the, the Q&A, uh, I have other questions, but uh, uh, let's see. From Mr. John Forbes, to all the speakers, Dr. Chua explained how India, Indonesia, Vietnam have reduced corporate taxes and opened their economies to attract FDI. Trade is a partial catch up, but still 25% above the competitors. But this administration has achieved nothing so far to open restricted sectors to FDI. What can MAP do? to support opening reforms now and not wait until the next administration and the next Congress. Foreign firms are ready to invest many billions if allowed to do so. I'm sorry, that's not a question. That is a commentary which incidentally, uh, FEF, yeah, of which uh, John Forbes is a fellow, agrees with. Uh, as well as I, I, ga I gather our former chairman and still trustee, who is one of the panelists. Uh, let, let, me read, let me read the real question from Bing de Guzman uh, to the director, to Dr. Habito, sorry, I lost it, um, to Dr. Habito and Dr. Medalia, Indonesia's 
GDP declined by only 2% in 2020, if I'm correct. Are there lessons to be learned from Indonesia in handling the epidemic and economy? Uh, well, for starters, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm told that Indonesia never actually imposed a lockdown. So it's not, it's not surprising yeah. that the economy did not stall as much as ours did. Of course, we were the opposite extreme. So we, we did the lockdown and became the, the worst, uh, most severe lockdown. So that alone spells the difference. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, our lockdown, two weeks of lockdown, two weeks of lockdown in the first quarter made the quarter and quarter GDP contract by 5%. Just two weeks. 5% of a quarter, 5% of a quarter, which is 5% uh, of a quarter, which is 1% yeah. of the year. Can you imagine uh, two weeks doing that, right? So uh, now I, I, I bet you that, the, that uh, of course, it's very hard to do a counterfactual. The, the control of the disease uh, would have been not, ma would, they only, would, would have been uh, only marginally, infection rates would have been marginally higher. If we, if the lockdown was partial and targeted rather than total. I think, that we've, I think we've learned that lesson, but still we have very, very risk averse uh, politicians. Uh, they're even more risk averse than the, yeah. the IATF. You're, you're absolutely right, uh, Dr. Medalia. I recall in relaxation of the age restrictions, uh, Secretary Mon Lopez uh, pushed that together with the economic cluster. It was approved and then there was a a, 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 a flip-flop for Malacanang driven by local governments. Do, do you know the local, uh, would you have any kind of insights on the, on the political economy of this? I should mention too, you mentioned domestic tourism. The, the, the lament now of the uh, uh, transportation group, especially aviation, is that they are, are very inconsistent and uh, in, in many cases quite overly strict rules with respect to travel from LGU to LGU. Uh, again, I, I, I put that up if, if, in case anybody yeah. would like to comment on this. Their lack of standard rules, unlike in other countries, uh, including Indonesia, where domestic tourism is something like 10 times uh, what ours is in terms of uh, uh, passenger traffic and airline. Uh, let me keep reading. From Dr. Conchita Manabat, there was a mention of the informal sector, gray economy. May we know your views on the impact of the seemingly growing sector? A number of the recently employed, unemployed, or underemployed have gone into home-based micro businesses or the like. Now, this is very interesting. Anybody care to comment on that? Well, Robbie, clearly the, everybody's adapting. And uh, people are making adjustments, uh, filling in gaps. You know, but at the same time, the the impact on the for, the, uh, the informal sector was per person a lot. The number of persons affected was a lot more. In fact, in that sense, uh, GDP decline of uh, ten percent understates what happened to the informal sector. Maybe the informal sector was hit by twenty percent. You know, thirty. Uh, look what happened to the jeepney drivers, the gun, no? uh, the, the, the sidewalk vendors, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. So, so I think, uh, so it's a two-sided thing, right? That in the informal sector was hurt a lot more and they are poorer. And this, this, this justifies uh, what Shell is, 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 is advocating, which is uh, assistance to the poor. And the hungry, uh, but at the same time, the the, the informal sector is also making uh, adjustments. Now there's somebody who brings fish to our house. Okay, so we don't have to go to the market anymore. You know, so so the somebody uh, selling us cookies and things like that. So so the informal sector is a uh, is doing its share in adapt adaptation, but. At the same time, the, in the long run, we, we wish the informal sector was not accounting for, for so much uh, of the employment. For instance, uh, the agriculture, transport, and storage, and another sector accounts for 
50% of male employment and only 20% of uh, GDP. Similarly, and she'll talk about God, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm out of battery. So, uh, so I guess I have to sign off. <laughs> let, me, let, let me take over from that. I, mean, I just wanted to reinforce what Philip said. Yeah. You know, one, one statistic I watch every quarter is uh, from the labor force uh, survey, where there is a category of uh, employment by category of worker. And here we have uh, wage and salary employees self-employed, and there are two within the self-employed. Those are individually self-employed. So this is where you can think fishbowl benders, balut benders, but there's also the self-employed with employees. So these are the guys who are actually uh, operating a small enterprise. And last, of course, is unpaid family labor. Now, I'm particularly interested in the self-employed with employees category, which dramatically, just like everything else, by the way, dramatically dropped by the second quarter. But by July, during the July survey, there was already actually an increase uh, so much that, so, so much so that it was even bigger than what it was in January, in the January survey. So that affirms what Philip is saying. That a lot of people who lost their jobs and livelihoods actually turned to the informal sector, got into a small business of their own. These are the guys who are now delivering the fish and the vegetables to your house every day. And yeah, we have a lot of that here in Los Banos as well, by the way. So clearly that drop, that negative 9.5, must have overstated the real drop in economic activity because there's a lot in the informal sector that may not have been captured. But I, just, I just want to add that informal employment tends to be uh, uh, acts like a counter cyclical social safety net, right? When things are yeah. bad, then they shift to a informal sector. And then the big question we have is, well, what's the quality of that employment? What's labor productivity growth, income growth? So it may, it may look like overall employment looks okay, but a shift from formal to informal normally is actually characterized by much weaker kind of productivity, weaker income, weaker income gains. So it's actually symptomatic of a problem rather than really, uh, we should not see it as a cure or solution to the growth. Well, but, but that's the reason why I'm more interested in the self-employed with employee, <laughs> because that implies that there is a small enterprise, but the self-employed individually are pretty the kind of jobs you're talking about, the, the, the fishbowl benders and then mangangalakal, which simply means salvaging garbage and so on. That's not the kind of self-employment we want. And so what is interesting, like I said, is even that self-employed with employees has actually improved. So people are getting into business or being forced to get into business, uh, small as it may be, but somehow it is actually helping. People got to eat. I have a question from Professor Porsche Macaranas for the panel on productivity issues. How serious will this be in the medium and long term as the pandemic may have destroyed labor productivity and perhaps capital productivity? I think both Shell and Johanna talked about scarring. Uh, what's your guess on how, how, how serious will this be? And maybe you can try and translate it in terms of impact on medium term growth. I think Philip had remarked that don't expect us to go back to the uh, 6 to 7% growth rate of the past decade. Uh, to begin with, that level may have been unsustainable because this, this is coming from a, a, a situation of a build-up in the investment uh, to GDP over a period of time and a very benign global environment. Uh, so going back to the question, what's your medium-term outlook uh, after things have normalized? Well, clearly the, 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 the pandemic and because of the hunger and the, the illness it has uh, brought about, is affecting short-term productivity of workers. I mean, just one good illustration of that is my usual carpenter and painter have lost a lot of weight. In the last, and I know I've seen them before the pandemic and now. But the other thing though is, as I said, opening up the economy, which we have continued to do, has actually served the purpose it was meant to serve, which is to induce both government to invest more in increasing productivity and the producers themselves. And this is happening in the farms right now. So that is the other the counter force uh, lo looking down the road that may actually help uh, you know, address this loss in productivity due to sheer uh, lowering of the quality of the human capital that every individual uh, possesses. So, but clearly we have to invest a lot in the short term to precisely reverse that trend in the reduced human capital that people are actually suffering. Yeah, I Joanna, just, yeah. No, 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 yeah. I just wanna Philip? Clearly this, I think, I mean, this loss of productivity growth is a problem globally, right? It's not specific to Philippines. 
And I think that what we're seeing now the manifestation of the pandemic is really the haves and the have nots, which Shell had talked about in, in the presentation, right? Okay, us, we're able to use and harness technology so we can still do our jobs and maintain decent amount of productivity level. But there are a lot of jobs that are not as, you know, that cannot work in this remote setting. And therefore yeah. that obviously cannot be as productive. And you know what we're seeing globally, right? The rise of digital firms, right? So even though there's potential productivity growth, it's very uneven. So some leading firms are very productive and then the rest of SMEs are much less productive. So this unequal outcome could still mean that overall productivity growth declines. And I think the worry I have in Philippines is, and Shah had talked about this, right? The, the erosion of labor productivity of skills. So people who are losing their jobs, losing skills, the young people who are not getting the right education, how to keep up with the skills, which is why you need to offset the productivity shock from this COVID by providing other structural reforms like opening up, improving, making business easier. You know, you have to have some offsetting productivity boosting reforms to offset the damage from this. The other thing I was actually thinking about is sort of a long-term scarring is because, the, you know, because of the uneven nature and some industries may not go back the way it is. So we have to look at how we're gonna, you know, the, the risk of idle capital. Uh, so for example, if, you, if the world built around capital to kind of, you know, to kind of accommodate the Chinese tourists, for example, in a world where maybe Chinese consumption habits and gambling habits may change, you have to either repurpose this capital to something else, otherwise you're going to end up with stranded capital or idle capital. So we need to think of ways how to transform our economy in the new way of how things are going to be operated. And that's going to be a challenge because you know, if we had a construction boom uh, on the back of this industry or demand that's no longer going to be there, and, and it's going to take a while for us to repurpose that capital, yeah. we have long-term ramifications on growth. We are down to our last 10 minutes. I'm going to read a number of comments, some are questions, and I will leave it to your hands, in your hands, what you'd like to comment on. This one is from Bobby Castillo, president of AI. Why talk about productivity now when the more urgent need is for people to be gainfully employed to feed their family? Uh, here's one from John Forbes. Again, what are the prospects of OFW jobs to bounce back? and for remittances to continue to grow for how long? Incidentally, OFW remittances uh, surprised uh, by being quite muted in the contraction. People were, uh, analysts were forecasting double-digit contraction for this year, but it only contracted but maybe, what, 1%? What, yes. what are, what's your outlook on that? Uh, uh, so maybe, Romy? Yeah. yeah, please. Romy, uh... That's actually a bad sign. Uh, very resilient OFW, which which means we have exported the best. No, actually, there's a so uh, so. But our exports have always been wrong. Uh, the the uh, the global financial crisis, they were wrong. They're wrong again this time. Uh, but that tells you we have we have, we have exported the the most resilient, the most flexible, the most street smart. Uh, <laughs> The, 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 be, the people who are very good in personal relations, these are, these are the people we have exported. And our, our problem is, and I used to say this, there was a time when uh, the best part of the Philippines sleeps in a different time zone, right? OFW and BPO. So our, so our problem is getting, getting new horses to drive growth. And I, initially, I was thinking tourism until the, the epidemic uh, happened. But tourism is, is a major case for repurposing. The Filipinos who used to travel abroad are itching to travel. They, they will travel, but they have to reduce all those restrictions. Like uh, just going to Anbaya Cove near Subic, we, we spend one, we, uh, with the six of us, we'll, we'll spend 10,000 on tests just to, just to go. Uh, from one place, one, one, one place to another. All of, all of these restrictions has, has to be, somebody has to come in and rationalize the... By the way, it's not just the Philippines where there was a, this was a problem. This was a problem too in Australia. If, yeah. if, if, every, every part of Australia wanted to be a separate country, trying to keep out. But that, if everybody tries to, that, to do that, the entire country goes down. So this is a national public good, having, having rules that yeah that uh, cover uniform rules that cover yeah. all, all the all the all the places yeah. Amen. So, there's, uh, very, there's a very yeah. easy there's a very easy explanation also why the remittances have uh, not dropped as much and in fact are going up simply because you know usually the OFW remitting money uh, down back home 
is targeting a certain peso amount that he or she wants to, to, to send. And with appreciating peso, they have to send in more foreign exchange to be yeah, able but, to sustain that level of peso income. But so the, mere fact that they can, the, mere fact that they, the mere fact that they can target means they still have jobs. Job. Yeah, so, so again, uh, you're right. I, I, I was talking there. to some seamen and they, they were telling me after the financial crisis, after the global financial crisis, their boat became all Filipino. The non-Filipinos were fired. Now, uh, so, so yeah. for some reason, our, our, our workers are preferred. We were not unionized, not like the Greeks and the Eastern Europeans, yeah. <laughs> I think. Anyway. Okay, so, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Romy, I hate to be a party pooper, but I was asked <laughs> to queue you at 1.25 okay. for your last okay. question. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, maybe uh, let, let me ask, let, I, I'll, I'll reserve the last question for a Winnie Monson type question. If you guys were still the professors in UP that you were, uh, what grade would you give this administration in, in coping with this crisis? Uh, I'm, I'm no longer a professor. <laughs> <laughs> That's a safe answer, huh? <laughs> well, Shell, Shell. I'll, I'll be a little generous. I'll give a 2.5. Okay. Three is the passing as uh, UP graduates uh, would know. Just so we feel better, how would you grade the Trump administration? Oh, that one, maybe, I think lower. Well, I guess that one would be about <laughs> 2.75 or even. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Joanna? Sorry, I'm a global, I work for a global financial institution, so I can't really grade government. It's kind of dangerous <laughs> to do that. But the proof is the pudding. So in the end, yeah. outcomes speak for itself. And I'll just leave my comment there. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, okay. I guess uh, that's it, uh, Mr. President, Madam MC. Uh, thank you. Thank you again to my uh, distinct, our distinguished panelists and, and good friends. Maraming salamat po. That's always the problem when you have the best minds. Time is always <laughs> your enemy. Uh, let me now, let, let me ask our president, President Gigi, do you have any parting words before we adjourn? Uh, you're on mute, G. Uh, Gigi, you're on mute. Uh, <laughs> Many thanks to our distinguished speakers and we've been able to keep uh, the event extremely lively uh, and and I think it, I'm glad this is our second one and uh, the most important part is that we give diverse views to our members so that they can pick and choose what they wish to uh, understand and take in and and then in the end we're all working anyway for the same country and um, as I said privately it's useless to self-flagellate at this point in time we just have to help each other uh, to move forward and give suggestions that hopefully will be listened to by um, outside uh, parties and not just MAP members. Okay, thank you very much, Gigi. On that note, let me again also thank our speakers, Drs. Joanna, Ziel, and uh, Philip, and our quasi doctor, Romy, as moderator, for, for the tremendous takeaway value that you've given everybody. Let me thank all the participants for staying with us, and we hope to see you in our next GMM. Thank you, everybody. Stay, stay safe, stay well, stay strong. We'll see you again. Bye bye. Thank you, Malu. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Good job, Malu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Dapat may part 2.